just told Christy, I just love listening to her sing. She's just, God's given her such a gift. It's just so effortless. So, so I've decided she's going to sing all night for us. So I'm just going to sit down. And let her <laughs> Uh, no. <laughs> uh, glad to see you tonight. Uh, a lot of you got to, to see uh, my dad's face again. You haven't seen him maybe for a while. And, and uh, Dad Jack and, and stepmom Diane and uh, my, my younger sister Carrie, you know, the not so good one. Um, <laughs> Her husband, Rick. Yeah, I'm getting smacked for that. Okay. <laughs> hey, uh, finding your Bibles, Matthew 18. We'll be there in just a little bit. Matthew 18. Uh, so I, I was just walking around a little bit and and just reminiscing and uh, <clears throat> was out here uh, on the side of the church and just was trying to figure out. How in the world, next to these crab apple trees, we actually play Red Rover? Yeah. There's no room there. <laughs> How well I just careened into a tree, I don't know. But, uh, and then we were singing uh, uh, the song here, what, Power and Blood, and all I could hear was Pete trying to get us to say how many powers in a row as we went through that song. Sound like machine gun. <laughs> Well, we've been on a journey into God's grace over the course of this week, uh, just looking into God's amazing grace and its power and its transformation. It's in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, that it tells us that, uh, <clears throat> see to it that no one misses the grace of God. That's God's desire for us. Now, the context, again, I remind you, is, is telling Christians that we can't let the things of this world hurt us and take us away, the bitterness grow in us, to take us away from God's grace. But it also makes sense that if we're going to see to it that none of us as Christians uh, miss grace, that we can't let the people who don't know God's grace at all miss it. So it's part both of those kind of things. See, the more we know, the more we understand, and the more we apply God's grace, the greater it's going to affect our lives. We've talked about how the evidence of grace is seen in our hearts being changed. We've seen how God, in his power, stooped low to bring us grace. Well, tonight we're going to look at what I call the vow of grace. That is, making the commitment to give it away. There's a woman named Victoria Rubolo, and it was a cold night in November in 2004 when there were six teenagers in Ronkincola, New York. <coughs> For whatever reason, they bought a 20-pound frozen turkey with a stolen credit card. And while they were driving out on Sunrise Highway, one of the boys, 18-year-old Brian Cushing, threw that frozen bird out the back window just for a thrill. 44-year-old Victoria Rubolo was driving to her home in Long Island after she attended her niece's music recital that night. She doesn't remember seeing the silver Nissan with the boys in it. She doesn't remember Brian Cushing uh, leaning out the window. She doesn't. She doesn't remember him throwing anything. But it all happened. That frozen bird crashed through her windshield, hit the top of her steering wheel, bent it inward, and struck her directly in the face. She was rushed to the hospital with her life hanging in the balance. She survived, but the doctors had wired her jaw shut. They had affixed one eye with wire mesh. They had bolted titanium plates in both cheeks. While she doesn't remember any of it happening, she's reminded of its consequences each time that she looks in the mirror. How do you show grace in a situation like that? Well, in 
until you experience grace yourself, it can be hard to understand how it feels. Grace impacts us at our core. When you experience it, you want to celebrate it. In fact, you even want to share it. Well, today we're going to flip the coin over on grace. And as we've been talking about receiving God's grace, now we need to talk about showing grace to others on the other side of that coin. You know, when you receive grace, it's all good. Who doesn't walk in that? It's all good when you're receiving it. But when you talk about showing grace, it gets a little bit messy. It gets a little bit hard. Grace is one of those warm and fuzzy subjects unless you're talking about a father who berated you or a spouse who cheated on you or a boss who fired you or a co-worker who stabbed you in the back or a relative who abused you. Grace is a fine idea when we're on the receiving end, but it's a whole lot harder when we call together. In Proverbs, the 14th chapter, in verse 10, <clears throat> I'm behind. In Proverbs 14, verse 10, it says, and Each part knows its own bitterness. And it's easy to live there. Well, all of us have been hurt, and we carry those hurts with us. You may have been carrying them with you for many, many years in your life. Maybe a, a person is abused, or they grew up ignored, or abandoned, or victimized, rejected, embarrassed, or bullied. And grace certainly gets more difficult in some of those situations. But one of the things that I want to point out to you tonight is something that Jesus teaches us, and that is that grace is something that must go both ways. Grace is only grace when it goes both ways. You see, biblical grace, God's grace, has to go both ways. If all you do is receive it, but you don't give it, then you stop short of what grace truly is. You know, this, this is uh, uh, something I came across, and it said, the litmus test for the reality of the gospel in your life is the extent to which you give grace and forgiveness to the person who has hurt you the most and probably deserves it the least. That is not an easy task to carry out. In Matthew chapter 18, starting at verse 21. Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Do you know that Jewish rabbis taught three times was enough? So when Peter it's saying seven times, he thought he was being pretty generous. In fact, he probably thought Jesus was going to say, Wow, Peter, I wish all the other disciples were just like you. <laughs> Do you think Peter had someone in mind when he asked this question? I think he did. I think there's a story behind this question. I think there's someone who hurt Peter, not once, not twice, but multiple times, and he's ready to be done with that person. You know, the people who hurt us the most are often the people we love, and some have been hurt so severely that they no longer give their love or give their heart away very easily anymore. They steal themselves, you know? No one's going to have that kind of power over me again. So sometimes we build walls. We build walls to try to protect ourselves from getting hurt ever again. Well, I don't know who that person was for Peter. It may have been just as difficult for him to forgive that person as it is for us to sometimes forgive the people in our lives. But Peter posed the most interesting question. How much is too much? When someone hurts you over and over again, how much is too much? How, how far is too far? When does grace finally run out? When is hurt greater than grace? Verse 22. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times, or seventy times seven. <clears throat> so Jesus answered, 
is that grace is never less than. Grace is always greater than. And some may feel like this kind of an idea is a bit unfair. You know? Let me tell you my story, preacher, because my story is an exception to showing grace. When you hear my story, you'll realize why they shouldn't receive it. Well, if that's something that's on your mind, if that's a thought that crosses your mind, I hope that tonight you'll consider another answer. Or maybe you're a person, when you hear those words, you say, absolutely, amen, that is exactly right. Grace is always greater than. But let me ask you a very important question. Is that what you practice well? Jesus gives us a parable to help us put into practice this idea that grace is greater than our hurts. Again, in Matthew chapter 18, go to verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. He began the settlement. <clears throat> uh, as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had to be sold to repay the debt. So the amount that the man owed was astronomical. And depending on the Bible you have, it may give you an amount or different things like that. But in today's numbers, you're probably talking hundreds of millions of dollars in this case. One that I read said $150 million. You know, Jesus used humor in his teaching. We just don't always get the joke. Well, the exaggerated amount here has a point. And we'll get to that point a little bit later. <clears throat> it was not unusual in the culture of that day for a person who owed money and was unable to repay it to have to work it off. Often they were called a slave. And <clears throat> in our culture right now, um, there, there's a lot of things going on that people just really, that, that word is really going to draw a lot of iron. But understand that in the Jewish culture, if someone had a slave, it was because that person owed them money, or they were a person that had committed a crime and they were being punished by having to work it off. That was how the Jewish culture practiced it. <clears throat> well, Jesus didn't tell this parable to justify the selling of this man and his family to pay off a debt. The parable is meant to reflect our standing with God. Our sin has racked up this incredible debt, and we can never repay it. No matter how hard we work and how much we pay back, no matter how many good deeds we do, we will never be able to pay it back. In fact, we have absolutely nothing to be able to pay even a piece of it. So this parable begins with the emphasis that we all this all owe this huge non-repayable debt. And the Bible paints this picture that there's this, there's this record of wrongs that God knows our sins. And even though no one else may know, God does. Your teacher may not know that you plagiarized that English page, paper, but God does. Your spouse may not know that you flirted with that person at work, but God does. You may have deleted your internet history on your computer, but God knows what websites you visited. The other waiters and waitresses don't know that you put a portion of the tips that you received in your pocket instead of in the jar to share with everybody, but God knows. No one else may know about your drinking problem, but God does. Your neighbors may not know how harshly you speak to your children, but God does. God even knows, in fact, the pride you may have right now because I didn't give an example of that applying to you. You know, we all have this huge debt and none of us can repay. Verse 26. The servant fell on his knees before the king. Be patient with me, he begged. And I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. <clears throat> there is absolutely no way this man is going to be able to repay all of this debt. 
So Jesus uses this astronomical amount to make this point. His master doesn't extend the note. He doesn't lower the payments. He cancels the debt completely. Now the words cancel the debt and let him go there in the scripture are verbs that can be translated forgive. He forgave this man's debt. Verse 28. Well, when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me and I will pay you back. So the debt owed to this first servant by the second one was minimal. It was easily paid back in small portions over time. The second man asked for patience in the exact same way that the first one did. Now if you've never heard this story before, you might think this is going to be a story about paying it forward. <laughs> This first servant just received forgiveness for this incredible debt that he had. I mean, he had to be ecstatic. You think about how much money he owed. And he and his family were going to be thrown in prison to work off the debt. But the king didn't just say, I'm going to give you a break. He said, I'm going to forgive you the debt completely. So you would think his mind right now is thinking, I'm going to pay this forward to somebody else. But that's not what he does, is it? Verse 30. He refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. So, interestingly, the fellow servants are the ones who reported this man's lack of grace. Um, why were they so outraged at this? They were outraged because they all lived in community. And they had this wonderful, generous king who treated them like sons and daughters, they had a master who was generous, benevolent, and gracious. So when one of theirs receives that kind of grace, and then he refuses to extend that type of grace, that same grace to someone else, it's a major problem, and they were so upset by it, they went and repented. Now it may seem a bit odd that in the midst of Jesus' sermon on grace, there's this call to outrage. But the reality is this, the community of Christ, the church, will not work if all we do is receive God's grace but refuse to give it. When we see brothers and sisters in Christ who have received God's grace but act ungraciously, <coughs> it should be a problem. We should be bothered by that and we should do something about it. So within this parable on grace, there's also this call for righteous outrage. As a church, we cannot be okay with ungrace. We can't be okay with it. It can't be something that we just look the other way on. It can't be something that just because that person happens to be one of the leaders in the church, that we say it's okay. We can't say because that person happens to be good at giving in the church that it's okay what they did because if what they did was totally not grace then it needs to be addressed it's not okay when one of our own is judgmental and condemning and gossiping, gossiping about others because they the others <coughs> think different or act different or struggle differently or just their lives are just plain a mess because we seem to forget that's really a description of all of us we all look different, act different, struggle differently, and our lives can be quite messy at times. 
Well, with this in, in this community called the church, we need to reflect the Master's heart. And it needs to be one of forgiveness and grace. Been in ministry, <clears throat> full time ministry since 1992, and uh, youth ministry a couple of years before that. Well, <clears throat> I've had the chance to witness God's church in all its beauty and glory and in all its darkness and hatefulness. And if you've been in the church any period of time, you've probably seen some of those same things. Sad things. Where the church didn't display grace. I thought about spending some time telling you a lot of stories, but I, I might just share a couple. <clears throat> one young couple married couple they were going to a church that the church asked people to uh, consider what they were going to be giving over the next year and make a pledge toward that so that the church could plan for its finances that way uh, something happened with this young couple's jobs and they found themselves unable to to, to have money uh, to even give much to the church at all, let alone what they had said they were going to try to give. Over the course of the year, as they got to the end of the year, the church sent them a letter that said, this is the amount of money you pledged. You have not met it. You are no longer members of this church. Don't come back. They had the chance to reach out to this young couple and help them and transform their lives. Instead, they told them what's valuable to us about you is the money you give. That's not grace. One young couple. Before they were married, they decided to move in and live together. She was a preacher's daughter. I mean, they, they were both Christians. They knew there was a better way to do it, but they decided to do this. One Sunday morning, at the end of the service, the preacher came down, and it wasn't her father, by the way, came down and stood and, and called them forward. They didn't know what was going on. Called them forward, and everybody in, in the seats stood up and surrounded them. And they told them, you two are living in sin. We're going to pray for you that you will change your ways. They couldn't leave. So they were trapped in this circle of people. So they had to stand there and listen to them pray. This horrible, graceless prayer. How these two couples continued to be in the church even after some of the horrible things that were done to them is the grace of God. But there have been some things that have been very dark, very sad. <laughs> I'll share this one with you. It was one that, that happened uh, in connection with the ministry that I had, and uh, we, uh, <clears throat> I was a youth minister, and so I was in charge of the uh, VBS for that year. A lot of the, the adults were excited because they didn't have to be the director. Okay. <laughs> well, <clears throat> we had a very small church building, but we had just made some dividers um, that could be moved around and we could create small uh, Sunday school classes with those. And so with that, I decided we're going to change the way that we had done VBS in the past. And because of the small building, we were going to try it a different way this time. And at the same time, I don't know if it was my uh, inspiration to kind of try a little something different, but the gal who was in charge of the food, the snacks for each night, decided you know what, instead of cookies and Kool-Aid, how about if we come up with things like fruit juice and, and veggies and 
uh, fruit just to share with the kids. You would have thought we just killed someone. <laughs> a meeting was called for after church one Sunday to let us know we don't want fruit and veggies. We want cookies and Kool-Aid. In fact, one gal actually said, and she was had some training as a nurse, said the natural sugars in fruit will get into their systems faster than the sugar in the cookies and will make them hyper more quickly. When she said that, I stood there like this. <laughs> that was quite the year. What's great is that I continued on to, to have uh, the, the VBS the way we planned it, in the design that we planned it. She uh, showed a tremendous, the, the gal who was in charge of the food showed this tremendous grace and when these, made all of these comments, she said, you know, why don't we just do cookies and cookies? <laughs> well, I had been told a number of times that there were some people that did not like the plan that we had for VBS and how it was going to lay out and how it was going to work. And so when that year when VBS was over, we had a closing meeting just to talk about it and uh, assign who was going to be the director for the next year. And when her name was announced, she stood up and said, we are immediately going to go back to the old plan of VBS because this year didn't work. <laughs> I asked her, eventually, I didn't ask her in the meeting, I asked her how it didn't work. Let me give you a list of what she said. That's all of it. Okay? Not one thing. You know what bothers me in a situation like that? What people were upset about had nothing to do with teaching children Jesus. But it sure gave people in the church a lesson on ungrace. There were some young couples that had volunteered to be a part of VBS that year, and they were sitting there with their eyes wide and backing up. They wanted out of there as they were hearing how angry people were because we changed how VBS was going to lay out each night. And we changed, wanted to change the snacks that we were going to have. How horrible. Literally, you would have thought we wanted to destroy the church building and destroy the church in that city. It's just ridiculous. But people get caught up in this ridiculousness of ungrace right in the church. Verse 32. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger. His master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. Now when it says tortured, they weren't putting the thumb screws and putting them on the rack. They were making him work off his debt. He was going to heavy labor, you know, hard labor. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> so the debt was now ordered to be paid back that um, and it's something that could never be paid back. It was absolutely impossible. He's going to spend the rest of his existence working to pay it off and never achieve it. And filled with overwhelming remorse, overwhelming guilt over his choice not to show grace to his fellow servant. You know what that's called? What he was going through? Hell. That's what that's a picture of. Jesus ends this parable with absolutely no vagueness. This is how my Heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. You know, one of the things that I am amazed at 
is you see a lot of teachings like this where there is someone who is you see the you see the parallels in the parable the master represents God the first servant is a Christian a follower of Christ who refused to show grace and because of it he was cast out do you get that as Christians we love the idea of being saved we love the idea of being forgiven but like I said yesterday so often we want his salvation but we don't want his lordship his lordship says I need to forgive the way he forgives and if I'm not willing to forgive the way God forgives then I don't get to enjoy the heaven that I so badly want this is a very real parable about the reality that one can lose their salvation simply because they refuse to be graceful the way God says we should be. That ought to rattle us. That ought to rattle God's church. We need to understand that grace is not an option. So preacher, what you're telling me here is that if I don't forgive that horrid hurt that was done to me, Jesus isn't going to forgive me. Those are Jesus' words, not mine. Not mine. We can't just receive grace from Jesus and be unwilling to extend it to others. It's not okay to receive grace and then celebrate receiving that grace week after week but refuse to extend it to others. But I know it doesn't seem fair though, does it? I mean, the people who hurt you, they owe you something. And in some cases that debt is pretty deep. I mean, <clears throat> I, I, please understand, I, I'm not trying to make light of uh, what's been done to you because for some people their hurt goes pretty deep um, and it's pretty hard but I, I hope that you will remember something very valuable you'll never be asked to give more than you receive from God but the more this issue comes from understanding the holiness of God God is absolutely perfectly holy so holy not only is he incapable of sinning it's just not within him he is even incapable of tempting us with evil with sin it can't come from him that level of holiness and our level of lacking holiness that's the key to understanding that we will never be asked to forgive more than we've been forgiven. There's a man named Jean LaRue who said, if the biggest sinner you know isn't you, then you don't know yourself very well. You know, it's it's difficult, though, not to push back against this idea just a little bit. You know, I may not be a sinner, but I'm not the biggest sinner I know. There are rapists, there are molesters, there are murderers, there are serial killers. And yet Paul called himself the chiefest of sinners. He called himself the worst of the bunch. But he was not referring only to his past. He was referring to his present. Because when he said those words, they were in the present tense in the Greek. I am the worst of sinners. You know, the more we know ourselves, the more we understand the holiness of God, and the more we recognize we can't outgrace God. Colossians 3.13 Forgives the Lord forgave you. That's what we're called. So, where I, I kind of want to just help us go tonight 
is I want to give you a few equations. I am certainly no math scholar, but there is at least one piece of math that I can remember. The greater than and less than signs. You know, from elementary school. I still get those right most of the time. Right? Well, here's a few of those. The first is this. Grace is greater than your repayment. What I mean by that is repayment says that person that hurt me has to make it right. You know, we were all taught as children that if we wronged someone, if we hurt someone, that it was our job to say and do something to make it right with that person, right? We were the ones that were supposed to go and say, I'm sorry. Well, and that's a fantastic lesson and something we ought to do. But it can also develop the mindset that gets in the way of forgiveness. Because that mindset says, if someone hurts me, then they need to come and make it right with me, or I don't have to forgive. We can run into that. We want justice. We want repayment. But is that what God's, God's Word teaches us about His grace? <clears throat> what do you do? When what was done to you seems is, is just so bad, so terrible that there's nothing that can be said, nothing that can be done to make it right. What do you do in that kind of situation? That's, grace is the only thing that can come in and redeem that. Romans 5 tells us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, we we all We've all struggled to forgive someone after they've hurt us just once sometimes, let alone many times. But God set in motion the work to forgive us while we were still continually sinning against Him. While we were still continually sinning against Him, He already had a plan to forgive us. His forgiveness was provided before we even saw it. That's grace. Another equation is that grace is greater than revenge. Revenge says, I'm going to hurt the person who hurt me the way I've been hurt. It's called sitting in God's chair, you could say. Sometimes we want to sit in God's chair, have his authority, have his power to deal with other people because they've hurt us. It, it's hard to see things, though, from someone else's perspective. We don't always know their story. We don't always know what's happened to them or what they're going through. And so sometimes we need to be able to step back and just ask some questions that are sometimes hard to ask. Romans 12 tells us, don't take revenge, but leave room for God's wrath. It's really tough, but we have to release the right, at least in our, in our minds, the right to retaliate. It doesn't feel fair. They don't deserve it. But let them go anyway. It doesn't mean you won't hurt. Grace doesn't mean you're not going to hurt anymore. There's no one in a place more deserving to exact revenge than God, and yet God, God longs to show you His grace. That's the lesson we need to learn overcome this revenge. And the other equation I want to show you is that God's grace is greater than resentment. Resentment says, I'm going to quietly become more and more bitter over this, and I am going to put them into a deep, dark prison in my mind and punish them. We become more and more angry, and we nurse the offense, and we relive the pain, and we, we keep hitting the replay button over and over and over again. But here's a question we need to answer. When you choose resentment, who pays for it? You do. Marilyn is a housewife who was raped at knife point in her own home. The rapist was caught later. He was prosecuted. He was sentenced to prison. After he was sent to prison, Marilyn felt God calling her to go visit him. 
this man who had assaulted her, terrorized her, so that she could express God's love to him. So she and her husband went to the prison, and Marilyn told this man that she forgave him. Now, it would be wonderful to say that the man was transformed after seeing this and gave his life to Christ, but that didn't happen. He remained unmoved. He remained unchanged. But listen to what Marilyn said about going to visit. It was the last thing in the world I wanted to do. But with my I was physically sick at the thought of seeing him again. On an emotional level, I was afraid of him. But with my husband's support and the prayers of many Christian friends, I was able to go to the prison and face him and say what I had to say. My feelings were not the issue. I knew what God wanted was my obedience. He wanted me to love this man with my will and my words, even though in my emotions I could not stand beside him. This is about giving grace because we receive grace. We're not endorsing the deeds of the other person when we do this. Jesus did not endorse your sins when he forgave you. He just showed you grace. Grace is not blind. Grace sees the hurtful well, but grace chooses to forgive instead of rehearsing the hurt. Grace is refusing to let the hurts poison us. Resentment has, has been defined in this way, and I love this definition. Drinking a bottle of poison and waiting for the other person to die. Hebrews 12, 15. Our verse for the week. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Do you know when the ungrateful servant had the other man thrown into prison that he had to pay for that service? The ungrateful servant had to pay to put the other man in prison. That is a perfect picture of resentment. We just run into this in our heads. You know, that person hurt you, and you put them in this resentment prison, but often they don't even know they're in that resentment prison. So who's the one paying for it? You are. Grace is simply greater than it. It's greater than your sin, it's greater than your hurts. Because we have this great and amazing God who through his son, Jesus, wipes us clean, God takes the record of our wrongs and he exchanges them with Jesus' record of holiness. And through Jesus, we are without blemish, we are without defect, we are made righteous and we are made holy. Our sins have been removed from us as far as the east is from the west. That's what we receive through Jesus and that means that's what we're supposed to give. And that's hard. key to giving grace is to stop rehearsing the hurt that's been done to us and start dwelling on what Jesus has done for us. Because the grace that Jesus has been uh, the, the grace that has been shown to you through Jesus will give you the, the strength to show grace and forgive what's been done to you. So we need to understand this reality. To accept God's grace is to accept, accept the vow to give it. Victoria Rubolo. Get in the face with that turkey, that frozen turkey. Spend time in the hospital getting her face rebuilt. Nine months after her disastrous November night, she stood face to face with the young man in court. Brian Cushing was no longer a cocky kid in the Nissan. He was a trembling, tearful, scared, and apologetic little kid. You know, for New York City at that time, he had come to symbolize a generation that was just out of control. And people packed the courtroom to see 
that he got what he deserved. Well, the judge's sentence, though, when they heard it, enraged them. Six months behind bars, five years probation, counseling, and public service. That's what he got. The courtroom erupted in anger. Everybody objected, except Victoria Rudolph. The reduced sentence was her idea. She'd spoken to the judge about it. After the sentence was handed down, the boy walked over to her. She threw her arms around him. And in full view of the, everybody in the courtroom, she held him tight. She stroked his hair. He sobbed as he laid on her shoulder, and she whispered in his ear, I forgive you. I want your life to be the best it can be. Later, she responded to questions saying this, God gave me a second chance at life, and I passed it on. If I hadn't let go of that anger, I'd be consumed by this need for revenge. Forgiving him helps me move on. We need to do that. Forgiving helps us move on. You know, tonight, uh, it's, this is one of those topics where it's, it's easy to get very uh, upfront and, and just challenge all of us because it is absolutely heartbreaking to witness the church show on grace. But I also hope that tonight, I wasn't just speaking to church, I was speaking to you in your life and what's going on in your life. And the reality that if there are things that you're hanging on to, and you're letting resentment build in your heart, the one that it's hurting is you. It's not hurting the person you're not forgiving. And I know it's not easy. It is certainly very difficult. And I get that I don't know what happened. But God does. And He still says, grace is the answer. And it's amazing how God works. When we take the grace He has shown us and we show it to other people who absolutely don't deserve it, whether they seek forgiveness or not, and we forgive them, it helps us move on. And it helps us heal. One of the great gifts of faith, one of the great gifts of grace, is giving it to other people. Watching it transform yourself and possibly even them. Will you pray with me? Father, every single one of us know that what we talk about tonight, this is not easy sometimes. Sometimes there are things that have happened to us that are so, so hard to forgive. But you know the damage it causes us when we hold on to that resentment and that hate and that anger and bitterness. It doesn't contain, it isn't contained just in us. It actually flows out to other people and infects other people. That's what Hebrews 12 told us. Showing grace helps heal. And it starts right here at home with ourselves. But I also ask that you help us as your body, as the people of your church, to show one another the kind of grace that we should be showing each other. To truly hold valuable what's valuable and not show a lack of grace, especially over the most worthless things. If we have made such mistakes, Father, 
Will you help us find the strength to go to those people that we've hurt and seek forgiveness, telling them that we weren't very good at showing grace, but that we want to be from this point on? And will you help us find the strength, the strength in you, to reach out to those, or maybe we can't even reach out to, to those that have hurt us. And we just show them grace and forgive. Not asking for repayment, not asking for the score to be settled, but just forgiving. Help us to have your heart of grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.